page 309. Section Cognitive Poetics Para Cognitive Poetics is a method of reading literature which combines linguistics and psychology with the aim of better understanding basic cognitive processes. Some of its important practitioners are Ryu Wen, R-E-U-V-E-N, Stur, S-T-U-R, comma. Professor Emeritus of Hebrew Literature at Tel Aviv University. Peter Stockwell, S-T-O-C-K-W-E-L-L, currently of Nottingham University. Alan Richardson, currently of Boston College, USA. Joseph Tabby, T-A-B-B-I, currently of the University of Illinois at Chicago. And Ellen, E-L-L-E-N, Spolsky, S-P-O-L-S-K-Y, currently at Bar-Ilan, I-L-A-N, University, Israel, Para. The Latin verb cognoscere, C-O-G-N-O-S-C-E-R-E, means to get to know, and from it comes the English term cognition, which means, says the concise O-E-D, quote, the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge through thought, comma, experience, comma, and the senses, unquote, semicolon. The adjective is cognitive, meaning, quote, relating to cognition, unquote, stop. The cognitive sciences study the way of the mind is organized, the processes of thought itself, and the mind as the interface between inner and outer worlds. A revolution in this field took place from the 1950s onwards, closely connected to the cross-disciplinary currents looked at in the previous chapter, whereby the disciplines of anthropology, psychology and linguistics began to talk to each other. It was also partly the product of the growth in computer technology, which began to offer possible models for the mechanisms of mental processing. Another significant factor was the challenge offered by the American linguist Noam Chomsky, born 1928, to the behaviorist approaches to mind associated with the psychologist B. F. Skinner, 1904-1990. Chomsky's famous review of Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior in Language, 35, number 1, 1959, pages 26 to 58, challenged the view that language acquisition can be accounted for in terms of cumulative responses to external cues and stimuli. Chomsky took the opposite view, seeing language acquisition as a creative internalizing process for which the human mind, page 310, is uniquely equipped. It is natural to suppose that studying language will help to explain how the mind works since language use seems the most intricate and characteristic of human cognition processes. For instance, basic language tropes, T-R-O-P-E-S, like metaphor and metonymy, M-E-T-O-N-Y-M-Y, seem to correspond to fundamental methods of apprehension and understanding. Since the first fuses, F-U-S-E-S, two or more concepts into a single new whole, while the latter lets part of something stand for the whole something. But, see the cognivists, If we are talking about mental processes and relating them to metaphor and other rhetorical devices, then we have entered the territory of literary criticism. So the idea of a combined form of critic which blends literary criticism, philosophy of mind and even evolutionary biology and neuroscience begins to seem less bizarre. Para. During the early 1990s, the basis for this combination of fields was being laid in the work of Israeli critics Reuven Zur, T-S-U-R, toward a theory of cognitive poetics, second edition Sussex Academic Press, 2008, and Ellen Spolsky, Gaps in Nature, Literary Interpretation and the Modular Mind, SUNY Press, S-U-N-Y, 
1993. At that time, literary theory was dominated partly by post-structuralism, which brooked no counter to its view of language as nothing but instabilities and relativities, and partly by the historicism whose bottom line is that everything is socially and historically constructed. Any notion of nature was regarded with extreme suspicion. The very word was taboo, and as we saw in chapter 13, this was the intellectual taboo that eco-criticism had to challenge. In a way, Chomsky's theories of language bring nature back into play. Language acquisition can't be entirely accounted for in terms of such notions as stimulus, comma, reinforcement, comma, deprivation, comma, as Chomsky says in the Skinner Review. That is, social factors such as encouragement, rewards and approval, demonstrations and coaching cannot entirely account for the child's acquisition of language and the capacity to learn language must in some way be wired in or in it. And while Lakin had, it is true, argued that the unconscious is structured like a language, see chapter 5, his ideas about how a language is structured were not very precise since they were not based on any systematic empirical investigation. Indeed, the disregard of empiricism, by which we mean detailed practical investigation rather than conceptual theorizing, was another of the great weaknesses of the dominant theoretical paradigm of the 1980s, which now met its inevitable challenge. Page 311 Para. These are the factors then which came together in the 1990s and resulted in the growth of cognitive poetics. A key moment in its emergence was the 1998 annual convention of the Modern Language Association in the USA when a forum was set up by Francis Steen, S-T-E-E-N, and Lisa Zunshein, Z-U-N-S-H-I-N-E, on Quote, literature and the cognitive revolution, unquote, and a discussion group on quote, cognitive approaches to literature, unquote, was started at the same event, see quote, literature and the cognitive revolution and introduction, unquote, the first item in the poetics today, special issue on cognitivism, which is itself an important landmark in the establishment of the field of cognitive poetics and makes an excellent starting point on this topic. Para. Alan Richardson's essay in that special issue of heartache and head injury, reading minds in persuasion, unquote, gives a sense of the characteristic interests of cognitivist critics. The essay reads the character of Annie Elliot in persuasion in relation to the cognitive science of the day. The broadly accepted view of the mind in Jane Austen's day was socially constructivist, which is to say that it saw the mind as formed by circumstances and events. A classic literary example illustrating this consensus would be Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where the monster's character is formed by the treatment it receives. Generally, the mind was seen as passively imprinted, a tabula rasa, T-A-B-U-L-A-R-A-S-A, shaped by the imprint of circumstance, following the views of British empiricist philosophers John Locke, L-O-C-K-E, 1632-1704, and David Hartley, H-A-R-T-L-E-Y, 1705 to 1757, both of whom saw the mind as a kind of empty potentiality which is shaped by the impress of experience so that the crucial factors are education and social conditioning. Those forces make us what we are or rather what we become. From Mary Wollstonecraft's W O L L S T O N E C R A F T apostrophe S The Wrongs of Woman through to Simone de Beauvoir B E A U V O I R and Beyond 
quote, one is not born a woman, comma, one becomes a woman, unquote. This view has been essential to feminism and it is essential too to modern notions of social justice where we believe that merely punishing the criminal with prison etc will not eradicate crime because we also need to eradicate the social conditions which breed criminal patterns of behavior. Quote, one is not born a criminal, comma, one becomes a criminal, unquote. D. Bivar might also have said. Likewise, we might believe following page 312, the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus and the German romantic poet novelist Enovia Elias that character is destiny, which sounds like a form of fatalism indeed, though less so if we also agree with George Eliot that circumstances make character. The first of these statements about character essentially means everything is given while the second means everything is made. A third view would be, quote, everything is partly given and partly made, unquote, comma, and this seems closest to the view that Jane Austen puts forward in persuasion embodied in her character Annie Elliot who at 27 is pretty well middle-aged by the standards of heroines in novels for whom the going rate was then about 18. The word embodied is deliberately chosen for the novel in Richardson's reading insistently shows mind and character as embedded and embodied in brain and body. Annie Elliot says Richardson is paired with the false heroine Louisa Musgrove, M-U-S-G-R-O-V-E, whose, quote, mistimed leap towards Frederick's arms, unquote, page 145, results in her, quote, head first fall onto the paving stones of the sea wall known as the Cobb, C-O-B-B, at Lyme Regis, L-Y-M-E, R-E-G-I-S, unquote, stop. The blow to the head alters her character for life, just as Annie's character has been altered by her life's disappointments. Her mother's death when Annie is 14 and the breakup of her romance with Frederick five years later. One suffers from a broken heart, the other from a broken head, says Richardson. The fall changes Louisa's nerves and her fate, says Austin, for mind is embodied not free-floating in soul-like independence. Likewise, our descriptions of Annie Elliot's reactions show mind and body, cognition and corporality in close alignment. When Annie thinks of Captain Wentworth, quote, unshackled and free, unquote, Richardson says it makes, quote, her heart beat in spite of itself, and brought the color into her cheeks, unquote. In Richardson's reading then, the subject matter of the novel shows a concern with cognitivism. In Persuasion, Austen is in dialogue with the thinking of a period about thinking, somewhat distancing herself from the extreme social constructivism seen in contemporaries, such as Mary Wollstonecraft, Henry Goodwin, and Mary Shelley. The cognitivist reading of the novel brings these issues to the fore, concentrating on how the novel centers on these notions of the construction of subjectivity. Section Cognitive Poetics and Practice More frequently, however, cognitive readings focus not on the content as such of the work, as in the example just discussed, but on the cognitive processes which are made evident in the Reader's decoding of the content, two aces from cognitive processes in practice, Joanna Gavins and Jared Steen, Rutledge 2003, are closer to this cognitive norm. Peter Stockwell's chapter, Surreal Figures, reads Surreal Poetry, while Craig Hamilton's quote, A Cognitive Grammar of Double Quote Hospital Barge, Double Quote Unquote, by Wilfred Irwin, unquote, reads a seldom discussed piece by Irwin. 
Stockwell takes the key cognitive distinction between figure and ground as his basis and I'll use this terminology but my own example to give a sense of the kind of procedures used in cognitivist essays. Here are the opening sentences of a short story. Indent. The liner began to move away from the quay side. Q-U-A-Y S-I-D. Full stop. On the boat deck stood a woman in a purple evening dress. Stop. In her hand was a crumpled telegram bearing the postmark Paris 14th stop 15 comma 30 june j-u-i-n 1958 stop staring ahead comma her arm resting on the ship's rail comma she let her fingers loosen as if unconsciously dash their grip on the crumpled paper comma and it fluttered down into the waters of the harbor stop in then closes para in a literary text, a common kind of attractor, A-T-T-R-A-C-T-O-R, that is a way of drawing the mind's attention, takes the form of presenting a smaller or moving figure against a larger or static background. As in the opening sentence, quote, the liner began to move away from the queer side, unquote. The ground, whatever in the mental picture isn't the shape, suffers neglect, the opposite of attraction, while the liner attracts attention. The original figure can be grounded, made into background or occluded by a second figure slash ground pairing, quote. On the boat deck stood a woman in a purple evening dress. Now the shape, or rather a specific part of it, is the ground for the figure of the woman and the process can be repeated. Quote, In her hand was a crumpled telegram bearing the postmark Paris 14th dot 15 comma 30 June 1958. Unquote. In this sentence there are three more figure slash ground profilings in rapid succession. The woman becomes ground to the figure of the hand, then the hand becomes ground to the figure of the telegram, and finally the telegram itself becomes ground to the figure of the postmark. The term to profile is used because it is the outline of the figure against the ground. That is, figure and ground working together or intersecting to which or by which the attention is drawn. Here then, I am taking the technical terms figure, ground, profile, attraction, slash attractor, neglect and occlusion and illustrating how they work with a simple example. It will be clear that I am focusing, page 314, on how the mind is directed by the words and images of the text and I haven't commented at all on aesthetic matters. For example, how effective is this opening? Is it too fast or too stark or too melodramatic? Nor has there been comment on matters of literary history. For example, issues such as how typical is this of the author's usual opening ploy? How familiar is it as technique and subject matter of the short stories of its day? Nor has there been comment on matters of interpretation. For example, questions such as who is the woman? What's in the telegram? Is this a story about loss and separation? As even this brief example implies, cognitivists tend to be less interested in such questions than in the mapping of the mechanisms of cognitive process involved. The next sentence reads, indent, staring ahead, comma, her arm resting on the ship's rail, comma, she let her fingers loosen, dash, as if unconsciously dashed their grip on the crumpled paper comma and it fluttered down into the waters of the harbor stop in then closes para in this sentence the loosening fingers are the figure and everything else is the ground but there is also another foregrounded element which is designed to attract our attention to a particular detail for as stockwell says quote attractors can be formed by stylistic features in the text 
that display linguistic deviance, unquote. Page 16. The detail of the loosening fingers is laid up to by a series of participial, P-A-R-T-I-C-I-P-I-A-L verbs, those ending in I-N-G, comma, like staring and resting, which are passed over rapidly and the focal detail is indicated by the finite verb she let, S-H-E space L-E-T. But here we have an interrupting construction which interrupts the expected word order and thereby draws attention to the adverbial phrase, quote, as if unconsciously, unquote. This happens because the phrase is unexpectedly positioned for it breaks up the usual English word order of subject. Her fingers, comma, verb, loosen, L-O-O-S-E-N, comma, object, their grip. Normally, we would expect the adverbial phrase, quote, as if unconsciously, unquote, to follow its verb as in a sentence like, he, subject, lifted, verb, the dog, object, with great care, adverbial phrase, unquote. Moved from its expected position, the adverbial phrase, as if unconsciously, is defamiliarized, losing its cloak of familiarity and suddenly seeming very prominent. So the notion is conveyed that the action may not actually be unconscious at all, but deliberated, performed so as to look unconscious. Hence, the notions of acting and looking introduce the idea that somebody is watching at home this performance is directed page 315 possibly someone unseen maybe in the distance with binoculars and yet sensed as somebody whom she is pretty sure must be there perhaps to another person is to retrieve the paper from the harbor someone of whose presence for the benefit of the unseen watcher she feigns feigns unawareness Little of this is explicitly stated in the text, but drawing attention to the words as if not just the reader's thought processes in that direction. The scenario then is open to development in these ways, and this is subtly conveyed to the reader through the disposition of the language and the perceptions I have been tracing, which instigate the cognitive processes of the reader in response to the verbal cues and clues which are on the page. Para, one further verbal element which is worth commenting on is the phrase, quote, she let her fingers loosen, unquote, which also contains a peculiarity, one which can be seen if we ask how that phrase differs in effect from, quote, her fingers loosened, unquote. We can begin to answer that question by comparing it with a variation such as she forced her fingers to loosen, a version which would indicate that she performed the action with reluctance as if under duress of some kind and some wishing to be a party to the consequences which will follow that action. So the added word forced would indicate an inner conflict of some kind. What effect, by contrast, does the word let have? But this question is hard to answer precisely. It may imply that she gives in to an urge or a necessity without being entirely in assent with the action. She goes along with it, but without being entirely happy with herself for doing so, perhaps. This is speculative, but it does seem clear that the phrase gives the first glimpse of complexities of motive or psychology within the character which begins to move our attention from the scene without to the scene within. Para. The foregoing gives an impression of the aim, style and emphasis of the cognitive approach and perhaps some of its potential drawbacks will be apparent. For instance, while it is interesting to show cognitive processes at work on a key segment like the opening of a text, it is not necessary to go all the way through the story in this manner if the primary aim is merely to demonstrate or explicate those cognitive processes. If the reader's main interest is the story itself, however, some more complete analysis will be needed 
though page 316 this kind of analysis will soon begin to seem tedious surely to most readers even for a fairly short short story the problems are similar to those of stylistics with which the cognitive approach shares a good deal procedurally and intellectually para one solution to such problems is to look for very short texts to operate on but the disadvantages are obvious Craig C R A I G Hamilton uses Wilfred Owen's sonnet length poem The Hospital Barge but the literary merit of that poem seems slight to me another is to find items which are marked by a high degree of linguistic or procedural eccentricity such as Hemingway's a very short story in Elena Semino's piece or the experimental fiction of Donald Barthelem B A R T H E L E M E in the chapter by Joanna J O A N N A Gavin G A V I N in most cases the reader learns in each essay something about some aspect of cognitive grammar in the Wilfred Owen essay possible worlds theory and text worlds theory in the two chapters just mentioned and contextual frame theory in Catherine M Mutt's chapter on plot twists in popular fiction since about half of each essay is devoted to explicating the theory in question this shifts the center of literary study a long way towards the study of cognition itself and there would need to be very solid and convincing grounds for doing that the cognitivists themselves keep saying that cognitivist poetics is exciting but that of course must remain a matter of opinion and as hans adler and sabine gross say in their answering essay to the special issue of poetics today on cognitive poetics quote cognitive analysis dot 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 quite often seem unexciting and didactic to non cognitivists unquote page 19 the given grounds for shifting the orientation of literary study are of a surprisingly moralistic kind that it makes the study of literature much less elitist because cognitivist poetics quote sees literature not just as a matter for the happy few unquote page 1 also the cognitivist seems surprisingly to go along with the functionalist challenge to the study of literature and the arts the practice of producing yet another interpretation of a text from the canon they say has been challenged by the taxpayer cognitive poetics offers justification for the spending of taxpayers money because the cognitivists show that literature is grounded in some of the most fundamental and general structures and processes of human cognition and experience page 2 ultimately they are aiming to give quote a psychological account of the whole problem of aesthetic page 317 an artistic experience comma or comma another hot issue comma literary invention stop unquote you may wonder whether this double agenda is really sensible and you do have to decide which you most want to spend your time studying great literature or the cognitive processes of the human mind it's the same thing the cognitivists would say and you can't study one without the other but in reality we surely can and as adler and gross say the rest of us have the option on cognitive poetics of either adopting it or merely paying heed to what its practitioners have to offer inevitably most will choose the latter but to see even the second as necessary cognitivism will have to make itself relevant for the analysis of specific texts to appeal to mainstream literary studies richardson's discussion of persuasion from a cognitive angle certainly seems to me to add a new dimension to our understanding of that text so it passes the test but i am not entirely convinced that the more technically cognitivist readings always tell tell me a great deal about the text that i couldn't have reached by a simpler route however there is something intriguing 
about the immense optimism of the cognitivists. They always seem to see themselves as being on the threshold of a great breakthrough. So I am keeping an open mind on this as on other varieties of theory after theory. Section What to Read on Cognitive Poetics Adler Hans and Gross Sabine Adjusting the Frame comments on cognitivism and literature. Pages 1 to 26 in Poetics Today, 23.2, Summer 2002, which is a response to the previous item. Gavin's Joanna and Steen Gerard edited Cognitive Poetics in Practice, Rutledge 2003. Richardson Allen and Steen Francis F. edited Literature and the Cognitive Revolution, which is a special issue of the journal Poetics Today, 23.1, Spring 2002. Stockwell Peter, Cognitive Poetics and Introduction, Rutledge 2002. Sur, T.S.U.R. Reuven, Towards a Theory of Cognitive Poetics, Toward a Theory of Cognitive Poetics, North Holland, 1992. Page 318, Appendices, Appendix 1. Edgar Allan Poe, comma, The Oval Portrait, the chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me in my desperately wounded condition to pass a night in the open air was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the Apennines, not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls, not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks, which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary, in these paintings my incipient delirium perhaps had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow and which purported to criticize and describe them. Page 319, Para. Long, long I read and devotedly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me and outreaching my hand with difficulty rather than disturb my slumbering valley, I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book, para. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room, which had hitherto been thrown into deep shed by one of the bed posts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for not shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze, 
In a very few moments, I again looked fixedly at the painting. Bara. That I now saw aright, I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses and to startle me at once into waking life. Para. The portrait I have already said was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders done in what is technically termed a vignette, V-I-G-N-E-T-T, manner, much in the style of the favorite heads of Sully, S-U-L-L-Y, S capital. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded, and the filigreed in moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself, but it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person? I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design of the vignetting and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such an idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained for an hour perhaps, half seating, half reclining, page 320, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute lifelikeliness of expression, which at first startling finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position, the cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view. I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. Quote, para. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, comma, and not more lovely than full of glee. Stop. And evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art. She, a maiden of rarest beauty and not more lovely than full of glee. All light and smiles and frolicsome as the young fawn. Loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette that and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work which went on from hour to hour and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man who became lost in reveries so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastily in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on uncomplainingly because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words as of a mighty marvel and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her, whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, 
for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work and turned his eyes from the canvas rarely even to regard the countenance of his wife and he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sat beside him page 321 and when many weeks had passed and but little remained to do save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp and then the brush was given and then the tint was placed and for one moment the painter stood and tranced before the work which he had wrought but in the next while he yet gazed he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast and crying with a loud voice coat this is indeed life itself exclamation unquote, turned suddenly to regard his beloved she was dead so as edgar allan poe selected writing spenguin appendix 2 dylan thomas a refusal to mourn the death by fire of a child in london poem <clears throat> stanza 1 never until the mankind making bird beast and flower fathering an all humbling darkness tells with silence the last light breaking and the still hour is come of the sea tumbling in harness stanza 2 and i must enter again the round zion of the water bead and the synagogue of the ear of corn shall i let pray the shadow of a sound or sow my salt seed in the least valley of sack cloth to mourn stanza 3 the majesty and burning of the child's death i shall not murder the mankind of her going with a grave truth nor blasphemy down the stations of the breath with any further elegy of innocence and youth stanza 4 deep with the first dead lies london's daughter robed in the long friends page 322 the grains beyond age the dark veins of a mother secret by the unmourning water of the riding thames after the first death there is no other source collected poems 1934-52 dent appendix 3 william cowper the castaway please get it read by your reader page 322 to page 324 then page 325 to page 330 are selected references chapter is where do we go from here further reading and there are references then pages 331 to 338 contain index of words the book finishes here i would like to mention a few points as a recordist number 1 the book contains a large number of visual marks such as parentheses quotes single quotes double quotes and indents font changes it is see just to help the reader visually understand and distinguish between text references etc it is difficult to read them within the text for a visually impaired listener because it creates a lot of interruptions so as far as possible i have tried to restrict them so whenever if you feel like quoting a particular place please try and check the original text the book is in the collection of the society for the visually handicapped state central library west bengal kakurgachi kolkata 54